Our first speaker up is Horatio Alduz Aguirre. Okay, I apologize. <laughs> and I will just turn it over to you. Yeah, thanks for that introduction. Uh, my name is Horacio Aguirre. I am a scientist at the University of Wisconsin-Madison at the Biological Systems Engineering Department. And um, today I'm going to present some of the work that we've been doing with Becky Larson, Erin Silva, and Michelle Watio at the University of Wisconsin, and Nicole Rakovich at Organic Valley. And we've been um, assessing um, different um, organic dairy farms uh, in the U.S. And, but today I'm going to focus mostly on greenhouse gas emissions and how important it is to consider the carbon um, that stays uh, in the soil from manure for carbon sequestration targets. Okay, so like I said before, for this project, we partnered with Organic Valley. Um, Organic Valley is one of the most important um, organic dairy cooperatives in the US. They have more than uh, 1,700 um, uh, farms throughout the US, uh, which represents more than 50% of the organic farms in the country. Um, and they have clearly, um, you know, they have established clear mitigation, greenhouse gas emission mitigation goals, which are very aggressive. By 2050, they want to become carbon neutral. Uh, by 2030, they want to reduce 50%. And by 2035, um, 30% of their greenhouse gas emissions. So in order to do this, they not only need to, you know, look for alternative management practices and, you know, different, different ways that they can start reducing their, their, their impact, uh, but also they need to establish a baseline, right? So in, they need to establish a baseline, baseline in order to see, uh, start quantifying uh, and measuring those, those mitigation targets. Okay, so the project that we've been, uh, you know, doing, uh, conducting with them uh, in the last two years, uh, phase one just concluded. We evaluated different environmental impacts. We evaluated greenhouse gas emissions, ammonia emissions, uh, electrification potential, land use, water use, and um, fossil fuel use as well. Uh, today, I'm gonna focus on the greenhouse gas emissions, but if you're interested in you know, knowing more about the other environmental impacts, I'm gonna be here all day and tomorrow, we can talk about those. Um, we focus on this first phase on four regions, uh, Midwest, Great Lakes, New England, uh, California, and the Northwest. Uh, and we are starting the phase two, which um, where, we're com when, where we want to complete the rest regions. You know, we divided the United States states in eight regions based on the farms of Organic Valley, but also based on the climatic you know, distribution um, according to the IPCC of the US. Uh, and yeah, and then we, we, we want to start assessing you know, these mitigation practices and what is gonna be needed to really become carbon neutral in, by 2050. Um, so for the system boundaries, if you're familiar with life cycle assessment, uh, we, if we, we consider a life cycle approach, with, which means we need to evaluate the system since the very beginning, the extraction and production of raw materials that are used, in this case, in our farms, uh, like all the gasoline, diesel, fertilizers, soil amendments. So how not only the use on the farm, but how would they produce and transport it you know, to the farm? And besides that, well, we are evaluating, um, you know, the, the activities that happen in the farm, how's the herd um, managed, uh, what's the diet composition, because that's going to affect all the different um, elements like carbon, like nitrogen that are going to affect greenhouse gas emissions and overall environmental impact. Uh, how their crops produce, what is the machinery used for, for you know, harvesting, fertilizers, etc. Um, we're having in our farms mostly, uh, well, only the two only products that are produced in all of our farms are uh, milk and meat. Um, and we're using for our functional unit, uh, if you're familiar with, if you're not familiar with, with LCA, a functional unit is just the common denominator that you need to express your environmental impacts, right? So uh, fat and protein corrected milk as the functional unit, uh, corrected to 4% fat, 3.3% protein. And since we have two products, milk and meat, if we want to express our environmental impacts in terms of milk, which is the main product of you know, our farms, uh, then we need to assign the environmental impacts that we uh, calculate in our farms well, to those products. So we use an allocation strategy following the International Dairy Federation recommendations that overall assigns 85 to 90% of the impacts to milk and the rest to meat. 
So we saw this uh, this morning way more, you know, compl a more complete picture uh, uh, and uh, it for, from the main, one of the key speakers, uh, carbon cycle. So we're evaluating um, methane, we're evaluating nitrous oxide, and we're evaluating carbon dioxide coming from fossil sources. We are not evaluating uh, CO2 emissions coming from biotic sources because, uh, you know, that's part of the, the, the carbon cycle. Uh, it's being captured by the plants that go into feeding the, the animals, um, um, which, which is totally different than the carbon from fossil fuels that you're taking that carbon from below ground or it's stored there for thousands and millions of years, and you're putting it into the atmosphere. So where's our data coming from? So multiple places uh, for management practices and like how much uh, the, the farms consume of each, like each resource how much fertilizer, how much gasoline, how much diesel, et cetera. We uh, conducted a comprehensive survey with Organic Valley in, this, in the, their farms. Um, so we got pretty good information there. Um, but we are also using, for, for the accounting of emissions, we're using process-based models like IFSM, Al uh here. So that's his model. We're using the IFSM model, um, IPCC uh, emission factors, and we're using also databases that are built into SEMA Pro, which is a life cycle assessment um, software, um, which has very good information in terms of the impacts um, associated with the production of, you know, air, energy and material uh, sources like gasoline, diesel, et cetera. Uh, we're also considering environmental factors in each of the regions. So each region is, is you know, has different temperatures, different precipitation, which overall affect uh, our emission estimations. So how we're doing this, we are taking average temperatures in each state and based on the number of farms that are in each state, and then we're doing a weighted average uh, in order to come up with a, with a regional average. Uh, crop yields from USDA, an average of the past five years for each of our same, each of our states and then average for the regions. And then we're, we're modeling, uh, replic replicating the electricity mix in, in each um, region as well, based on you know, the, the source mix um, and based on the emission factors that are <clears throat> presented by the US Energy Information Administration. Okay, so overall, this is graph presents our results for our four regions, uh, Midwest, New England, California, Northwest, uh, and our model farms in each region. So the name of these scenarios here uh, show the number of lactating cows, and then the letter shows the type of animal. So for example, this uh, 50H grass uh, farm has 50 lactating cows, Holsteins, and they rely mostly on grass. Um, we have an Amish farm in New New Midwest and New England, um, as well. So overall, we can see that our, our, our emissions are, you know, between 0.7, 1.1 kilogram of CO2 equivalents per kilogram of fat, fat and protein corrected milk. I remember we're expressing everything per milk production here. Um, a, a couple of things to highlight from this graph in green here, well, you see that was a big part of, of this morning's talk as well, enteric methane. Enteric methane is very important. The cow, you know, just, uh, that fermentation process is, is, is that's needed for a cow's living. So, but that's responsible for like 50% of the total emissions in our estimations. Um, overall, uh, we can see in orange here in those farms that have slurry or liquid manure, you know, the methane coming from, from, from manure storage, it's an important source. We found that farms that have less than 100 lactating cows, they mostly handle solid uh, manure, so and, uh, methane from storage is not as important as with the other farms. That handle, and we, we model, it's not reflected here, this is just the average for, for the entire year, but we model grazing and non-grazing seasons in order to you know, reflect the environmental factors as well and the practices and the diets, which are different during those seasons. Uh, for example, in Midwest, you know, during winter, the cows are not grazing, so they, they rely mostly on forages uh, which is interesting for manure, it, it's that even though there's less manure that's being stored during the non-grazing seasons, they're, they're, um, the grazing seasons are coincidental with summer and hotter months. 
and that really drives methane emissions up. Um, some other important, interesting things in red here, uh, N2 emissions from, from, from manure management. These two farms, 50H grass and 50H Amish farms, uh, have uh, bedded packs in both the Midwest and New England. So bedded packs, the, they you know, are, uh, require more bedding, uh, that are the ideal conditions and temperature rises, that there's a mix of feces in urine and all the nitrogen. So ideal conditions for N2O to be emitted. So those are, that's the reason why this gray bar is a little higher than the rest. California and Northwest here in purple, they import their feeds mostly from within the US uh, for forages, but also from abroad. So countries like China and Turkey, uh, so which contribute significantly to, to the impact from feeds you know, that are produced off farm, um, not only the production, but also mainly the transportation. Um, and, and then finally, you know, just highlight the carbon sequestration. So usually LCA studies that if you've seen them in the past, you've read uh, LCA studies of milk in, 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 in the past, usually uh, carbon sequestration is not included you know, it's hard to do. There are many variables uh, that affect the estimations and depends on where you, where you are, et cetera. But we, we thought it was important, right, to start thinking about carbon sequestration, especially for these farms that rely heavily on, on grasslands and grasslands are, um, you know, as, as we all know, um, carbon sinks because of the well-developed root systems that they have. So overall carbon sequestration here, you know, reduces from seven to 20% of the greenhouse gas emissions um, in the farms. Yeah, talking a little bit more about ca carbon sequestration, how we, we estimate and we included, um, you know, this attempt to, to include carbon sequestration in our model. Uh, we are, there are different models like COMET, if you're familiar with uh, COMET, the COMET model from USDA. Um, it also models some practices, but, but Comet models a change in practice, so an improvement from a baseline. So we wanted to see, well, what happens, you know, when these farms are being already grazing for a long period of time in our baseline. So we, to do that, we accounted for the carbon that stays on the soil. So from three main sources, above ground residue, below ground residue, and carbon from manure. Um, below ground residue, very important, because like I said before, pasture and grass, well-developed root system, the root shoot ratio of almost two. So the majority of the biomass in, in grasslands is below ground uh, versus like corn silage and corn grain that and other crops that, you know, majority of the biomass is above ground and the, the root uh, system is not as developed. Um, I'm going to talk about carbon, for how we estimate it come from manure in the next slide. But then after we kind of like accounted for using, you know, this root shoot rate, root to shoot ratios, harvest index, yield, what's the peak uh, biomass. And uh, we also consider the exudate, you know, which is very important uh, from for below uh, ground um, biomass. But after accounting for all these three sources of carbon, then we also consider conservation practices that are gonna affect the carbon exchange and stock. Um, for example, if there's tillage, uh, if there's cover crops, rotational grazing, irrigation, uh, based on I IPCC standards, they have um, some factors that you can apply ba based on these conservation practices. And finally, we use a carbon model, the carbon tool model, um, to determine uh, carbon sequestration potential based on there are different variables that are considered in this model, but at the end, it directly relates carbon sequestration to you know the carbon uh, that stays in the ground, but also temperature. So each of our regions have different carbon sequestration potential. And we saw this morning from one, one of the speakers and as temperature increases, so there's less uh, opportunity for, for carbon to be stored on the ground. So how we estimate a car carbon from manure, uh, just a mass balance of the carbon consumed, you know, in the dairy diet, uh, minus that carbon that goes with the milk uh, for lactating cows, the carbon that stays in the body of the animals uh, when they're growing for growing heifers, and uh, the carbon that's irritated you know, through respiration as CO2 and methane. One more minute. Oh my God. All right. So I'm going to go super quick here. Uh, this crazy graph 
just shows the importance of, of, of money right here in, in the blue bars is just the, the overall impact of you know, carbon sequestration and emission negative because it's a benefit of, for emissions. Um, here in top though, uh, we can see the percent where this carbon is coming from, right? Manure is in, in gray uh, and below ground residue in orange. So those are the two most important sources uh, of carbon, um, you know, Midwest and England. Off farm because in California and Northwest, um, of farm crops because the majority of those crops are coming from, from are imported. So uh, as just a summary of the you know, key points that I just wanted to highlight in terms of carbon sequestration, uh, majority of, especially for cooler regions, uh, the majority of the carbon um, that stays on the soil is, comes from below ground, from pasture and forages um, because they have a more developed root system, you know, uh, but manure is also a very important source of carbon. So we've been estimating the impacts, usually of manure. We, we keep track of all the impacts, all the emissions from excretion to, to manure land application, but we don't account for, for the benefits as well. So I think this is very important to start you know, evaluating and considering, um, even though there's controversy around you know, carbon sequestration because it's so difficult to do, but it, it's, it's needed. To, to it's, we need to include that as well. Okay, I just have another, we can talk about this evaluation, uh, evaluation of management practices later, but, but just the, the key point here is manure management has a key role in terms of you know, potential to reduce um, greenhouse gas emissions at the farm level. Okay, so with that, uh, sorry for the rush at the end, but uh, I'm here for, for questions.